Okay, this video is on repeated measures ANOVA, and I think uh, one of the most effective ways to think about repeated measures ANOVA is to bounce it off a, a statistical technique that we've already looked at in this class called the matched pairs t test. And let's think about uh, a situation where we have a matched pairs t test. For example, uh, let's say that we have a way that we think that we can measure fitness level, and we want to look at the fitness level pre and post. For a group of individuals. So let's say that we have five people, uh, five subjects uh, in our design, and uh, we give them, uh, you know, this first person gets a pretest score of, uh, you know, whatever it may be, 12, and they have a fitness level of 18 post test. Well, we can't do perform an independent samples t test here because we violate the independence assumption. Uh, you can't get more related measures than you do when you're measuring the same person. So we call this a matched pairs t-test. Some people refer to it as a dependent samples t-test. Now, let's extend that a little bit, not into pre and post, but let's say that we took multiple measures. So let's say that we have a pre-test, or well, a uh, a pre-exercise program, if you will, where this person has a fitness level of 12. And let's say that we bring the person back in three months after the program begins and they have a fitness level of 18. And let's say that we bring them in six months later and they have a fitness level of 22. And again, we're assuming a fitness level that's higher uh, is better than a fitness level uh, that's lower. And let's say that we bring them in one year later and this person has a fitness level of 24. So what we've done here uh, is we have taken repeated measures well if I could spell measures it would be sweet I can spell it, I just can't write it uh, so we're taking the repeated measures across time on the same individuals and under the same conditions. So guys, this is a classic uh, repeated measures uh, ANOVA uh, illustration. Now, um, th there's a lot of benefits to uh, a repeated measure design. Uh, so let's just talk about, uh, about this. Uh, before we go, go uh, much further, okay? Uh, sometimes also, uh, people refer to this as a within subjects design. But I'm kind of older school and I probably am gonna re refer to it as repeated measures. Uh, one of the m main benefits, at least in my opinion, of um, the repeated measures design is we need less subjects. Uh, another benefit uh, is we get more statistical power. So if you're conducting an experiment or some sort of research design where uh, you're, 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 you're having your subjects perform some task that's very expensive, you know, maybe an IQ test, who knows, those things are, are quite expensive and, and quite timely. Uh, you, you may have the benefits of, uh, uh, of a repeated uh, subjects uh, uh, or repeated measures design. Now, what happens here is kind of cool. Uh, let's think about if we were just conducting a standard ANOVA. And we should know by now that the standard ANOVA, uh, the, that the test statistic is the F statistic. And what we end up looking at is we look at the mean square. or the variation of the between factor over the variation within. Okay, and sometimes we call this the numerator, the variation of the factor, so mean square of your factor uh, or group and uh, the denominator being the mean square of the error term. What we seek to do in the repeated measures
is we want to uh, be able to account for the variation within the subject. So in other words, what happens is where we have our variation between over variation within, <coughs> as you'll see in the illustration, what we can do is we can partition this out into two components. First of all, we can talk about it in terms of the subject variation. And this is going to be more variation that we can explain, which is ultimately going to reduce this value. And then, of course, we're going to have still some error left. Uh, and this error is going to be uh, really uh, can be thought of more in terms of like an interaction. between uh, uh, our measurement and our subjects. Now, if you think about, um, um, you know, when, when we have variation across, uh, across subjects, um, you, know, you know, people's in, in this fitness level, let's bounce it off of that, people's bodies uh, react differently. And, um, you know, we, when, when a person from stage one to stage two to stage three uh, maybe has a higher fitness level, a different change in fit le fitness level, we, we know that that fitness level will be consistent across all subjects, that there's something else explaining that. Well, there's, there's some of that that we just can't explain. We just don't know why, uh, at least in our design, why uh, there is variation there. But then there's some subject variation that we can actually come in uh, uh, and, ex and explain. So what will happen here is we will reduce the variation that we call the error term um, which will ultimately increase our F value. This is going to be stable. This value up here will remain stable and uh, this, this, uh, the, the variation in our denominator will be reduced uh, because we're going to be able to explain more subject variation uh, or the subject variation part. We're going to be uh, kind of be able to partition that out or adjust it and uh, then we're going to be left only with the error uh, of the interaction between uh, the fitness and, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, kind of the treatment and, uh, and the subject. So uh, let's, uh, let's get into a little bit more about uh, repeated measures. Uh, first of all, uh, let's just call this the process. Uh, first of all, the design is the participants, and that's kind of vaguely speaking because it could be trees or what, whatever. Uh, provide data. Uh, at multiple time points. And we want this under uh, the same uh, same conditions. Okay. <clears throat> now let's think about the ANOVA just a standard ANOVA. Well, uh, this requires independence. And for reasons I've explained already, it's clear if you're taking the measurements on the same person uh, that you're surely not going to have, uh, or you, I'm sorry, you surely are going to have measurements that are going to be related. So we're going to violate that. And again, you don't violate the independence assumption any more than <clears throat> when you take measurements on the same person. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to uh, take uh, repeated measures. Now, if we try to do this under the assumption or under violating the assumption of independence, uh, we are going to lose power. And losing power is not good. That's uh, 
that there is a, a difference there and we can't detect it because uh, we don't have enough power to reject the null. So um, what we do is we enter in uh, the repeated measures design. Now, the assumptions for the repeated measure design are pretty much three. Uh, we still want normality across measures. We still want to uh, examine homogeneity of variances. But the most important thing that we need to examine when conducting a uh, repeated measures design is something called sphericity. Now, um, let me give you a difference. These two, uh, homogeneity of variance and sphericity, are very, very, very closely related. Uh, the only difference is sphericity is more the homogeneity of the difference of variances, where homogeneity of variances is the differences of variances. Uh, let's see if we can uh, uh, make this uh, make a little bit of sense. If we have group A and group B and group C, and uh, it would make sense that we could come in and you know get a sample mean and a sample standard deviation for each of these. Let's call this A. Okay. Now. <coughs> This is sample information, but we know from the population that each of these has a variance. And the homogeneity of variance assumption says that these variances are equal. Okay, now uh, imagine being able to look at a different measure. Instead of looking at this measurement, what we want to do is we want to compare the distributions. So if we come in and look at the differences between, for example, A and B, and look at the differences between B and C, and look at the differences between A and C, then we're going to create this homogeneity, uh, well, this sphericity uh, concept. So, in other words, our null hypothesis in this situation would be that the variance for the differences of A and B are the same as the differences from A to C, and the same as the differences from B to C. So the sphericity uh, looks at the variances of the differences uh, instead of the variances of the population. Now, if we violate uh, violate sphericity, Uh, first of all, we're going to have a loss of power. And uh, we can uh, kind of alleviate this or uh, at least attack that by considering uh, an alternative repeated measures test. Uh, I think it's called the Greenhouse Geiger uh, is a is a very uh, uh, commonly used uh, repeated measures test 
uh, in the in the situation where sphericity is violated. And I'm going to show you how to uh, how to uh, take care of all that. Okay. Um, let me uh, try to get on task here and get. Uh, Okay, we've done the repeated measures, uh, damages. Uh. All right, let's um, let's just go examine, uh, look at a problem. All right, I found this uh, problem, and um, I thought it would work really well for our first um, example. Maybe. <laughs> Computer's running really slow. Okay, so what I've got here in, in uh, Excel, it's a, it's a small design. Uh, well, uh, I only have six subjects. And uh, I thought the fitness exercise uh, example was pretty cool. And I found this online, so I, I thought it was kind of cool, too. Uh, what they've done is they've taken a, uh, three measurements. They took... Uh, the measurement before the program started. They took a three-month measurement and they took a six-month measurement. Now, <coughs> the first thing we have to do here before running the analysis in R is we have to recode this. And I think what you should know by now is that the way the data is presented to you here is not the way that uh, it's going to work in R. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to have information in, in terms of case information uh, in our columns. So uh, what I would want to do here is I would want to come in with a measurement called fitness. And it would call it fitness level if we needed. And I'm just going to copy these. And there may be a quicker way, I don't know, but uh, this is fine. Okay, so now I have my fitness um, uh, all in one variable. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to bring in my subject. So I'm going to call this uh, subject. And I'm going to have... To repeat this three times. Okay, so we can see, for example, that measurement 55 right up here uh, was from subject one, so the way I set up subject works fine. Okay, now the next thing I've got to do is I've got to set up my, uh, uh, my program. So I'm going to call this interval. So it was the interval on which the measurement was made. And it looks like my first six measurements are pre. So I'm going to just stay consistent with that. So I need to bring this down to the 44. Uh, the next measurements were made at the three month stage. Okay, I have no idea why that uh, switched on me, but, uh, huh, interesting. Uh, so the three month needs to come down to the 49, and then we had another measure at six months. And we need to bring that down to the final entry. Now, you know me, that's going to drive me nuts. Um, I don't like that. So I want to, you know, want all of it to be the same. Um, Let's 
Sorry, guys. Just the way it works. Okay, so now I have my uh, information in a in a form that's going to be accepted by by R. So I'm going to go up here and get rid of this. So I'm going to delete that. And now I'm going to do a save as. And I'm going to call this exercise. I'm going to save it on my desktop and uh, obviously save it CSV. So I'm going to save. It's probably going to come in and say that you know, you're losing your mind. Don't do that, but uh, we know it's fine. Okay, I don't need that anymore, so I'm going to quit Excel. Uh, I'm not going to save this because I've already saved it the way I want it. And you can see that I have exercise CSV uh, right here. Now, what I want to do now is I want to go into R and um, uh, do the obvious. And uh, I want to get my data. Attach my data, and I kind of like to look at the the names. Okay. Now, uh, something I want to do. I think it's always kind of good to look at uh, at the data. I realize right here that subject is is being viewed in R as quantitative. Well, it's not. It's uh, it's it's categorical. This is the first person, just like a Chevrolet. This is the second person, just like a Ford. You know, these are these are different people, but the numbers don't take on uh, true measurements, so we have to uh, keep that uh, in mind. Now, the first thing I want to talk to you about, or at least to show you, is uh, a couple of new things. First of all, uh, probably uh, the most uh, common approach to testing equal variances or homogeneity of variances is Levine's uh, test of equal variances. Now, if we were going to run a, an ANOVA, uh, so let's say the goal is to run a uh, you know, simple, straightforward, one-way ANOVA, a fitness uh, over, uh, let's just run uh, it across the interval. So we want to see if the means are different across pre, uh, three month, and six month. And that would be a reasonable thing to do. Now the repeated measures are going to give us a lot more power, uh, and I'm going to illustrate that through R. Uh, it's going to take a completely different approach. So if we want to do that, uh, you, you know, one, uh, the equal variance assumption is something that we want to test. Well, uh, here's a way that we can do that. <clears throat> if we load library car uh, there is a option which is Levine test so we could run fitness uh, over interval and uh, let's hit enter now I knew this was going to happen but I wanted to, wanted to show you something okay uh, right here, this is Levine's test for homogeneity of variance. Uh, the null hy hypothesis is the variances are equal. So a, uh, you know, a relatively high p-value here uh, is not strong evidence against the null. So we would conclu conclude that uh, we are satisfying the uh, test of homogeneity of variances. However, when I come out of here, I can see that the center uh, that it's been compared to is equal to the median. Now, if I were conducting a um, uh, non-parametric test, that's something I may be interested in. But uh, doing an ANOVA, which compares group means, I want to adjust this. And guys, it's really easy to do this. Just a uh, center equal mean. And uh, you'll see your p-value decreases a little bit. Uh, you get a little bit more power uh, by comparing to the mean. Same degrees of freedom. But still, we have a p-value that's le uh, greater than 0.05, so we can assume um, equal variances. So, 
So I want to run <coughs> a standard one-way ANOVA. So I'm going to call this model one. Uh, we're going to be conducting multiple models. So I'm going to run an ANOVA of fitness over interval. And I can run a summary of my model. And I can see that I get a, uh, a model that is not statistically significant. A couple of things I want to point out to you. Pay attention to the degrees of freedom. Uh, we know how to do that by now. Uh, pay attention to the sum of squares for the uh, group term. And pay attention to the sum of squares for our error term. Uh, we have a relatively low F value here which created a relatively high p-value. Okay, so our conclusion is the group means do not differ. Now, enter uh, into the uh, problem concept of repeated measures. In other words, there's some individual difference, some subject difference there that we may be able to account for uh, that's going to drastically lower our residual sum of squares. Now the first thing that I would want to do here is check the assumptions. Normality and sphericity. What I would do in normality is I would just take a look at the at a histogram and a box plot of my fitness. Uh, there's no reason to think that that didn't come from a normal distribution. And I'd also like to look at a box plot of fitness just to see if I have outliers. I don't. I have a relatively symmetric distribution. The next thing I need to do is I need to check sphericity. Now. What we need to do here is, first of all, we need to load what's called the EZ package. So I'm going to go library, EZ. It'll go through some stuff. And apparently it's done it. Okay. Now, what we do in, um, and this is, uh, this is, this is kind of weird, but, uh, the way that I found this to work it's one of those things uh, you've just got to um, you know I told you some time ago you know in your notes when you're uh, taking taking notes here you've got a uh, in the back of your notebook set up a, you know five or six pages there just for R commands so this should go under you know, how to check for sphericity uh, when conducting a repeated measures design because uh, this is not intuitively clear but what we're going to use here we're going to use what's called the easy ANOVA option and uh, first of all it's uh, tell what our data is and that's the data the next thing we do is we put in our dependent variable and you enter this kind of strange um, uh, you do a dot and our dependent is fitness the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put in our subject variation And uh, the next thing we want to do is put in within. And then I want to do it uh, type uh, three sum of squares. Okay. Okay, I think I know what's going on here. Uh, 
I think we don't put three. I think we just put uh, three. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Yeah, uh, notice that uh, I, w I was kind of worried about that up here at subject. I didn't know whether we needed to do an AS factor, but uh, it comes up with the warning, or it's much smarter than me, that it converted it to a factor for ANOVA. So that's kind of built into the, uh, to, to the, to the, uh, the code that we're using here. Now, the thing I want you to, to look at here uh, is this part right here. And... Um, it looks like our p-value is 0.1879, which is above uh, uh, 0 0.05. So using this, you know, this uh, this magical 0.05 uh, 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 you know level of uh, of making decisions, uh, we can assume that we are not violating uh, uh, the sphericity assumption. Now, if the 0.05, if we had been uh, had a p-value less than 0.05, then we would want to come down here and look at the uh, the greenhouse Geiger uh, uh, information, and uh, it seems to me there's something I forget that this is another one here. I forget exactly what that's called. Uh, uh, well, again, uh, if we get into a situation when you're when you're conducting, if you do a repeat of measures on your uh, on your master's thesis, then uh, uh, if this is something that we need to get into, we will. Uh, but I'd, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. Not prepared to talk about that today. Uh, I remember it, uh, but I don't remember it well enough to to sit here and teach it to you. Okay. Um, Guys, I'm not going to get into the calculations of the model. I'm going to let R do that. Um, so um, let's um, let's let's just go ahead and, uh, and and run some things. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the repeated measures. So um, what I would want to do here <clears throat> is I'd probably want to look at um, some means, and I would like to look at uh, fitness. Uh, across uh, interval uh, for the mean and uh, it gives us to a kind of in a wacky order but uh, the first measurement was 42.83 so we have a mean of 42.83 the next measurement was the three month of 45 and the six month was 49.67 so you know it appears that the uh, the fitness levels are increasing now if we don't attribute for or control for or at least adjust for the variation in subject then we can see up here from our ANOVA that we get a result that's not statistically significant but the um, repeated measures design is going to have more power and what's going to happen we're going to see this 143.4 remain stable but we're going to be able to adjust the error variation uh, by what we can account pretty much for the interaction between subject and uh, uh, and uh, the, the the measurement across over the interval. So the way we're going to do that, I'm going to call this uh, uh, model two, and I'm going to run Nova. And it's kind of tricky the way we have to put this in. Uh, again, it's not intuitively clear. So I want to run it over uh, interval. <clears throat> But I want to kind of adjust for the error <coughs> attributed for the interaction between subject over interval. <coughs> now if I do my summary for model 2, <coughs> uh, what I get is, let's see. Here of uh, oh this is wrong. <clears throat> okay, I'm kind of glad this happened. Uh, does anybody know what we did wrong? Rhetorical question, since you can't talk to me. Uh, and, and, and again, you might say, well, I don't know the command. This command's right, sort of. Guys, what we did wrong here is when I put subject in, I didn't enter it as a factor. 
uh, and you can see that there was no correction made so I committed a big boo-boo <clears throat> so please don't look at that that was uh, that was bad so ALV I should have gone fitness uh, over interval uh, plus the error over the uh, factor of subject divided by interval all right much better <clears throat> and guys when we run it correctly uh, I couldn't understand why I had this error term up here uh, and I see now because it was uh, it was why well, I did it wrong okay let's just let's just uh, not beat around the bush here so the first thing it gives us is the error for the uh, across our subjects and uh, then it kind of control comes in and controls for uh, uh, or takes a look at the at the uh, variation uh, of the interaction and just as I told you uh, you know what we'd expect from the standard ANOVA uh, way back uh, way back where you know way back up here the 143.4 uh, is consistent but notice how the residual the, the sum of squares and ultimately the mean square uh, look how this is re reduced from 50 to from uh, uh, 715.5 down to 57.22 now you can just imagine and, and we should we should have a, a very firm understanding on how F values are uh, are calculated. How they're the ratio of uh, of certain uh, certain uh, of our sum. Well, ultimately the mean square. And th there's you know obviously uh, a couple of ways that we can increase that. If we can hold the denominator steady, hold it stable, and increase the numerator, then the F value will go up. Or conversely, if we can hold this stable and decrease the denominator then our F value is going to go up so uh, what we can see here is we have um, uh, you know relatively high F value uh, giving us a, a P value of uh, 0 0.002 uh, now uh, in a nutshell uh, what we have here uh, is there's a statistically significant uh, difference across uh, across intervals so if I were going to write that up, uh, I would say something uh, probably kind of like this. Um, I would say uh, the six month, well, let's go in with uh, hashtag. I would say the six uh, month uh, exercise training program had a statistically significant effect on fitness level and we would have F uh, degrees of freedom 2 comma 10 our F is 12.53 and our p-value is less than uh, 0.0 one yeah but not oh oh one <clears throat> okay now where do these differences lie and just like uh, when when we conduct a standard uh, you know straightforward ANOVA uh, a one-way ANOVA uh, what we need to do is we need to do a post hoc well we need to do some multiple comparisons here uh, to tap into where the differences are statistically significant. So, we'll now conduct multiple comparisons. But guys, you, sh you should know by now that multiple comparisons lead to inflated type 1 error rates and uh, inflated alphas. So what we need to do, we need to adjust our alpha here uh, a little bit, maybe to, to 0.02. Um, no, you know what? Let, uh, no, I, I've got something more clever than that. Let me let, let's do this. So let's go with uh, our data, and I want to do a pairwise t-test, and I want to do it over fitness 
uh, interval. But guys, I want to do a P adjustment. And I want to use the whole method. And I've got to tell that I'm doing a paired T test. Yeah, that should work. Okay. Now, so we're doing a, a paired comparison t test, uh, but we've uh, we're, we're controlling the uh, uh, or we've adjusted the p value. So uh, these are actually pretty stable. Um, let's see. That's not what I, ex I was expecting. So with uh, data pairwise t test fitness over interval method hmm hmm that's not exactly what I was expecting uh, <laughs> well, well, well. Huh. 